I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. Michael Tatar Jr. is a graduate student at Veritas Seminary and known to Nashville, Tennessee talk radio audiences, Tom Bionic, co-host of the Future Quake program. He's going to present sleep paralysis, a modern connection to an ancient evil. Has anyone here experienced sleep paralysis? Just show your hands. You know what we're talking about. Wow. That's, wow, that's way really more than usual. Wow. Wow. Uh, I've seen this lecture presented by Mike in Nashville, Tennessee, and I knew it was a natural match for the alien abduction and the UFO theme in general. You're going to agree yourself that it's a very powerful piece of information in regards to the overall UFO alien topic. Please welcome up Michael Tatehart, Jr. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you said, I am Michael Tater, Jr. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about a condition that many, many of you, well, I would say many of you do not know about, but it seems like from a show of hands, we've already got uh, an audience that has a little bit of either practical experience or maybe even education about this. Uh, but I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a condition known as sleep paralysis. Uh, and the subtitle of this talk is uh, Sleep Paralysis, A Modern Connection to an Ancient Evil. Um, now many of you, I, I would say, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a speculation here, and I would say I'm probably talking to two audiences here. Uh, many of you come, come at this from a Christian perspective and likely agree with uh, uh, Joe Guy and I that uh, there is a spiritual answer to the uh, alien abduction phenomenon. Um, uh, for you, I would just say, just watch this and see. Uh, I think you'll probably agree how closely that some of this stuff adheres to both a biblical uh, understanding of the world, a spiritual understanding of the world, and how closely this co many of these situations cohere to the uh, alien abduction. You'll see a lot of similarity. Um, so look at this from, if that's your perspective, a Christian realist uh, perspective, Look at this from sort of uh, that perspective as another facet of the alien abduction phenomenon. Uh, and there's probably other people here that are complete materialists. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say atheists, but there is, they look at this from a completely non-spiritual perspective. I would just ask to sit back for the next 50 or so minutes, uh, stop and look and try and keep all of this information from a strictly, strictly truth perspective, if you will. Uh, just stop and look at the evidence that I present, uh, and just try and see how well the truth coheres uh, to all of this stuff. Uh, this is going to be kind of our general outline, the five points that we'll go over here, the duration of the, uh, per, of the duration of my talk. Firstly, we're going to be looking at what sleep paralysis is exactly, and to try and draw some lines on describing the experience. Uh, we will be looking at the capabilities of spiritual beings to see if there's any sort of coherence with what is shown in scripture comparatively to the sleep paralysis experience proper. Uh, we will then look at cultural experiences and historical perspectives on sleep paralysis to try and grasp an intuitive understanding on how long it's been going on, where it's been going on, uh, sort of who, it, who and, and where it's, uh, it's had its effects, and what else it might be called in other cultures. Uh, from there, we'll be looking at the medical community and its dissection of what might go into a stereotypical diagnosis of sleep paralysis, followed by just general observa observations. I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not an expert, although I've played one on TV. Um, and what else, you know, a few other things like that. What perspectives the medical community might, might have for doing and thinking and saying and prescribing certain things. Uh, we will then look at... Uh, both, actual, both an actual case of sleep paralysis, I believe, in the book of Job, as well as some possible causes of sleep paralysis uh, as defined in the Bible. Finally, we will look at why this all matters uh, and sort of the future. Uh, you know, why should we care? Why? Why indeed? Um, so with that out of the way, let's, look, let's, look, let's jump into our major, uh, our first point there in our uh, discussion. Sleep paralysis. What is it? As I mentioned earlier, before we can really dissect sleep paralysis with any degree of accuracy, 
it's probably best to draw some fairly accurate lines using symptoms typically associated with sleep paralysis. I mean, that sort of goes without saying. We can't talk about it without knowing what it is. Um, now, in my opinion, after studying this phenomenon for a while, it seems like there's at least uh, two fairly hard kinds of sleep paralysis. You've got one, and I'll, I'll give, you, give, you, give you this in sort of the idea of a Venn diagram. You've got non-spiritual sleep paralysis, where somebody sort of wakes up and they can't move, it's three in the morning and they just decide, oh well, I'm going to go back to sleep. Now then you have another side of sleep paralysis, uh, to the sleep paralysis diagnosis, where I believe it is spiritual in nature. Uh, the person wakes up, they, they can't move, uh, they typically see something uh, in the room, they feel intense fear. We'll, we'll get to the exact descriptors to it in a, in a second. And so what you have is non, non-spiritual, spiritual, and then usually some overlap in the center there. Obviously, we're going to be spending most of our time looking at the second type. The basic characteristic of sleep paralysis is really just what it says. Uh, it's marked by the complete inability to move or cry out upon waking or just before falling asleep. Um, the medical community speculates that this is a product of your body emitting a brain, uh, uh, your body emitting a chemical called acetylcholine that sort of slides down your brain stem that keeps you from acting out your dreams. Uh, uh, it sort of, and what it does is it sort of turns off your body, your body mechanics, so you won't, you know, cry out, punch the wall, all those things that. Uh, you might do if you acted out, tried to act out your dreams. Um, now, acetylcholine actually does a lot of things, and there are some problems with this diagnosis right off the bat. We'll get to that later, uh, but for now, that's just sort of uh, the important thing to remember is that sleep paralysis, the, the first characteristic is not being able to move. Another characteristic that is often reported uh, is hearing a buzzing or whooshing sound usually associated with the most serious cases uh, in the, the cases that I have uh, consulted on. Uh, it gets described in a lot of different ways. It's really weird to look at this, actually. Some people will describe it as a metallic sound, uh, like grinding metal. Other people will hear it as like a two-tone, sometimes called like a dual-tone thing, um, you know, like a test pattern from a TV. It's interesting to note, uh, as well, that out-of-body experiences Lucid dreams, astral travel, all of these people who describe these experiences, uh, they do two things. They describe it as, as a spiritual experience that's happening to them on many levels, and they describe this exact same two-toned experience. Uh, another characteristic that you see in sleep paralysis is an evil sensed presence in the room. Uh, the typical diagnosis goes like this. You wake up, you can't move, and there is something about what is going on, really before you realize that you're, you can't move, um, that just scares the tar out of you. It is, it is the most scary thing that, that people experience, uh, and that, that is almost always the case. Um, many, many respondents report having their spouse sleep through all of this stuff, which is odd, but they will say things like, uh, th and this, this is actually a case that I helped consult on. Uh, when given, this lady told me, she wrote me an email, she said, when given the difference between having my husband slap me in the face as hard as I can to wake me up out of that world, or staying another second in that world, I would prefer that he slaps me in the face. Um, it's, it's, it's that scary. Uh, often what you see uh, is a, some type of assault. Uh, you wake up, you sense this, you can't move, you sense this terrible fear or presence. Uh, a lot of times you'll see, a, you'll see, you'll have some type of experience, you'll see something actually in the room. Uh, and it's usually marked by some type of assault, either uh, strangling or something trying to pull you out of bed. Uh, the one that is most commonly reported is uh, what, they call, what they call standing on your chest or something, pressing on your chest. That, that really seems to be the most common, one, common thing. In fact, sleep paralysis is actually can be transliterated from some folk cultures as the demon who stands on your chest, uh, Kanashibari, or other, in other African folk cultures like the choking demon. <clears throat> uh, as, I, as I said, I got just derailed there uh, with the evil presence, but it includes an intense, intense fear. 
And I'll give you some, uh, since I've already talked about it, I'll give you a couple of, a couple of experiences. Uh, after months of frontline combat, a sergeant recently emailed me uh, to tell me that one of his men under his <laughs> command was refusing to go to sleep uh, after having a severe bout of sleep paralysis. His terror was so great. Uh, another person emailed and said that, the, that the, after the power and authority of Jesus Christ was brought to bear on a constant case of sleep paralysis, uh, her nightly bouts of sleep paralysis ended, and she was able to not be terrified about going to sleep uh, for the first time in a decade. The final one, uh, and really I find the one that's, that's most interesting and perhaps most telling, that there's really a lot more going on here than just a strictly medical thing, if you will, uh, is the fact that People oftentimes report seeing evil beings, and they always respond, respond to Christ's authority. You wake up in the middle of the night, you see this evil being, it attacks you, and something about it, uh, whether you're a Christian or you were raised in the church or whatever, you sort of call out, you know, Jesus, please help me, and oftentimes the experience stops in mid-sentence. Um, if you want documentation for that, I would just say go to YouTube and type in stop sleep paralysis or sleep paralysis and read the accounts of somebody, uh, you know, somebody will describe their bout of sleep paralysis. You go down to the comment section, you will find in any one of those things, somebody who said, I totally had this. Uh, they'll, it'll be like, I totally had this, man. And then I prayed to Jesus in the middle of it and it stopped and now I'm a Christian. You need, everybody needs to know this. Uh, and then you'll see people poo-pooing at it, uh, you know, yelling at it for it. Um, through it all, that's, that's, I think, one of the most telling characteristics that this is, in fact, has a spiritual connotation to it. Uh, let's look at some of the correlations we have to a biblical understanding or a supernatural worldview. <coughs> the first correlation uh, is the correlation of the spirit world uh, with both sleep and uh, paralysis. Uh, the fact that the spirit world and the spirit world contact uh, in general can find a loose correlation with individuals who either fall asleep or are put into a deep sleep in the Old Testament, uh, I think is really telling, actually. Check out these verses. In the book of Genesis, Abraham lays down and sees evil and terrible things. Genesis 15, verse 12, As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and darkness fell upon him. Um, one of the most one of the most apocalyptic books of the Old Testament is the book of Daniel. Um, and it seems like one of the ways you could read Daniel is I fell asleep and I saw a big vision. Uh, check out some of these check out some of these posts or some of these some of these verses. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Uh, Daniel eight eighteen. And when he had spoken to me, uh, he's this is Daniel talking, and he's describing having a vision. Uh, and when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face on the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. Daniel 10, 9. Then I heard the sounds of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Uh, so just in one book, we see Daniel, just the most apo uh, apocalyptic book there. Um, you know, he's constantly falling asleep. Everybody's falling asleep on Daniel. Um, here's Jeremiah, uh, often called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah uh, is talking to God in verse uh, chapter 31, verse 23 uh, through 27. And really, throughout, throughout uh, chapter 31, uh, God is talking to Jeremiah here. And Jeremiah is actually asleep. And as you'll see, I'll read the verses here in a second. Halfway through talking, halfway through getting this vision, uh, Jeremiah awakes and he's still... He's still talking to the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah 31, chapter 31, verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as yet they shall use the speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof, when I shall bring again their captivity. The Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. And there shall dwell in Judah itself, and all the cities thereof together, husbandmen, and they shall go forth with flocks. For I have sated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. So that's, that's ostensibly God talking to Jeremiah. Uh, and, and Jeremiah then says, Upon this I awakened and beheld, and my sleep was sweet to me. And, and thus forth, uh, 
God continues to talk to him. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah will see the man and will see the beasts. I don't know. So we see this, this interesting loose correlation between falling asleep and uh, uh, spiritual being contact, both, both by God and by angels and other, other entities. Um, this, the second point is the ability to cause intense fear. Uh, this passage we're going to, to uh, look at here, we're going to lend a, more, a little bit more of an extensive study later on in the talk. Uh, but for now, let's just look at a couple of verses here. Uh, Job 4.13 talks about uh, uh, a spirit attacking this guy named Eliphaz, coming to him in the, in the middle of the night when deep sleep falls upon men. Job 4.13, I'll read to you. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep fall upon men, Fear came upon me in trembling, which made all my bones to shake. And then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. So obviously notice here that the fear he describes is both intense. Uh, the fear comes before actually seeing the entity, which I thought was interesting. So there's both the sense presence and the intense fear. Another characteristic is the ability uh, of spiritual beings to interact with the world uh, with oftentimes physical con consequences. Um, and I'll just read one here real quickly. Uh, 2 Kings 19, uh, verse 35. And it came to pass that night uh, that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. When they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So we have this angel... Uh, going out for the Lord, uh, going out from the Lord. Many people believe. Well, we won't get into the into the theological uh, oddities of this passage. But anyway, we see just what the text says: some type of an angel of the Lord going out and killing 145,000 people while they all slept. So obviously, there's they can they can though they are spiritual in nature, i.e., not of not physical, non-physical in nature. Uh, we still see that they can influence the world and impact the world in physical ways. We also see that incidentally in Job 2. Uh, if you guys wanted to go and, go and read that, it's very interesting. Uh, the next characteristic uh, is that, obviously, if you're from, coming from a Christian realist worldview, uh, this is no surprise. Uh, but perhaps the most telling of all the spiritual characteristics that link sleep paralysis uh, with sort of a biblical worldview, a supernatural worldview, uh, is that there appear, appears to be a wide body of people that have ended the experience with the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, so we see that portrayed as a characteristic of the spirit world, specifically demonic in the New Testament. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we think about those two things being connected, it becomes pretty powerful. If you go to Mark 5, 7 and 8, um, you know, and, and uh, Jesus is dealing with the demoniac of the gatherings, and he says, uh, uh, verse 7 here, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Uh, and for he said unto him, Come out of the mound, thou unclean spirit. And in, uh, in the next couple of verses, the spirit leaves and go, goes into a, a bunch of hogs, and they run off into the, run off the cliff into the water. Um, so, as we can see here, just on a quick overview, there, there is definitely some correlation here. Uh, let's move on to our next of our five points. Sleep paralysis, historical and cultural perspectives. Uh, historically, we see sleep paralysis as a topic of discussion amongst European and Chinese writers for uh, at least 2,000 years. Um, I, I've, I've just got some other, other stuff. It seems like it goes back even farther than that almost to the earliest written records. Uh, but I'll give you what I have here in my, have here in my lecture so far. Uh, the influential Greek physician Galen, uh, who if, you are, uh, if you're a student of history, you may recognize the name. Uh, Galen examined the causation of the nightmare, uh, the, this, the nightmare being sleep paralysis, or ephelates, during the second century AD, and, and the description of the experience also appears in the Chinese book on dreams and their relation to uh, primitive medical <coughs> techniques dated to as early as 400 BC. Uh, cures for those suffering from the mare or Mara uh, appear also in late Saxon manuscripts 
uh, although these make little mention of the symptoms specific. Uh, descriptions of the nightmares, however, uh, begin to appear in England in the later medieval period. One of the 14th century manuscripts describes, for example, how the night Mara uh, lay on top of people and strangled them at night. Um, one of the most interesting places I found about the, you know, in the cultural and historical perspective section uh, was even Shakespeare mentions it in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Act 1, Scene 4, Romeo and Juliet. This is the hag, which is a common European name, a common English and European name for sleep paralysis and uh, demonic possession. Well, demonic harassment, anyway, in general. This is the hag when maids lie on their backs, oppresses them, and learns them first to bear, making them women of good carriage. Um, we even see sleep paralysis coming up of all places in the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, during the Salem Witch Trials, several people reported uh, nightmare attacks while they were awake uh, by various alleged witches, including Bridget Bishop. So if you're familiar with that, then you might remember the name Bridget Bishop. Uh, that may have been, that may have been, in my opinion, likely were a result of sleep paralysis. Uh, so we see this at least through the eyes of Western historical experience. It appears to have been going on, you know, at least for 2,000 years. Um, so let's take a look. We've taken a look at sort of Western historical experience. Let's take a look at uh, uh, sleep paralysis from the perspective of other cultures. Um, sleep paralysis across cultures. In Japan, it is called Kanashibari, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, sleep paralysis in Japan uh, is is you know, marked by the same thing. You wake up in the middle of the night, you see people, you see these beings and they attack you. Um, now, here's an interesting factoid uh, I found out while, while putting together this thing and in my research. Uh, in Japan, there was a church in Kyoto. I think it still exists today. I haven't had a chance to contact them. There was a church in Kyoto that would have, was having so many people experience sleep paralysis come to the church, uh, be talked to by one of the pastors. The pastor would articulate a Christian... Uh, supernatural worldview and tell them, look, you can end this by the name and the power and authority of Jesus Christ. They were having so many people come in, end sleep paralysis and become converted to evangelical Christianity that they actually made a comic book to give out as a, as a witnessing tool to other people. <clears throat> that's how, I mean, that's how, how common it was. Um, in the Creole culture, uh, especially before there were phones, uh, there were phones, roads, um, you know, easy ways of communication, where the Creole culture was sort of cut off a little bit. Uh, what you would see is people having sleep paralysis. Uh, I think it's called Kalchamar, I believe. Uh, they would have they would have sleep paralysis, and what would happen is they would go to a local witch doctor or uh, uh, the local, if you will, occultist, and the occultist uh, wouldn't even bother giving them giving them an occult cure. They wouldn't even bother saying, well. You need a bunch of chicken's blood, or you need to go, you know, roll the bones, or these other these other sort of uh, strange occult things. Uh, he would say, what you need to do is you need to go to the house of the Lord and get right with God. That's the only thing that's going to help you. Um, in African folk culture, it's near ubiquitous throughout, and it's often called uh, the name escapes me. The actual transliteration escapes me at this point, but it often translates, as I said earlier, into the uh, the pressing or crushing demon. The Muslims of the Southeast Asia uh, all recognize sleep paralysis as a spiritual attack. And to that end, they usually go to their, uh, their spiritual leaders, uh, sheikhs or priests or um, the other people like that. And, and they do a variety of things, and quite frankly, it's met with limited success. Um, the Haram people, we'll, we might talk about them a little more later, depending on time restraints, uh, but we see we see uh, in the Hama, in the Hmong culture, we actually see that uh, they used to be really an animist culture. And when when many of them came over here in the late 70s, uh, many of them converted to Christianity, you see a lot of people, a lot of the Hmong culture, reporting cases of sleep paralysis, uh, often couched in terms of uh, their ancestor worship, which was what their, what their original religion was. Um, where grandpa shows up uh, in the middle of the night and says, you need to worship me, you need to give up all of this Christian stuff. 
and you know they cast grandpa out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ and he leaves and he never comes back. Um, we see it mentioned in the Philippines called Banganut. Uh, Banganut is actually linked, of all things, with sudden and natural nocturnal death syndrome. Uh, there are various studies, uh, various peer-reviewed studies that link those two things. Uh, people who, what sudden and natural nocturnal death syndrome is, if you're not familiar with it. Somebody lays down and while they are asleep, something happens that appears to make them incredibly feel fearful, they have heart failure and they die. Um, so we see people who have survived, um, survived uh, the nocturnal, there's other symptoms to it such as heart palpitations and other things. People who seem to have survived the experience all report having uh, what could very tightly be termed sleep paralysis. Uh, it happens in Malta, it happens in New Guinea, it happens in Iceland. A Newfoundland one is particularly interesting because they say that a common cause of sleep paralysis is uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer backwards. That's typically, uh, according to uh, the Newfoundland cultures, folk cultures there, that's what brings on sleep paralysis, reciting the, reciting the Lord's Prayer backwards. Um, so we've got a quick overview of uh, both the historical and cultural perspective of sleep paralysis. Let's move on to our next, our next stuff here. Uh, observations from the medical community. Now, uh, we, live, we live, in my opinion, in a culture that has an extreme anti-supernatural bias. Uh, one of the things people often do when they have repeated cases of sleep paralysis is to go to their doctor. Uh, though many don't want to go, they have this internal thing that says, I, I don't know if doctor, a doctor is right for this. They've been trained that uh, anything in the supernatural worldview is just wrong. Um, so they go to the doctor and they like, I don't know, a medical expert, maybe he is, maybe he's not. We'll, we'll see what he has to say. Uh, so let's say someone goes to the doctor and complains about this. Waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to move, feeling the worst fear that he's ever felt in his or her life, seeing a dark figure or sometimes figures, uh, and sometimes sensing something grabbing him or something pressing down in his chest or attacking him. Um, so what the doctor's going to do, he's going to take all of this in, he's going to write it down, uh, and unless he has dealt with this before in some capacity, uh, or you know, rarely a Christian, a Christian doctor who has, or even a doctor with a supernatural world view, uh, he would probably take all the information in and ask a number of questions to do what they commonly call a case history. Typically, these questions are going to go like this. Wants to know about your employment history. Uh, some occupations have certain risks. Of uh, to name a few, animal workers are uh, at risk from uh, brucellosis, health workers from hepatitis, uh, miners from black lung, um, on and on and on like that. He's going to want to know about your drug history. Uh, both prescription over the counter and recreational. Uh, it's clearly it's clearly important to know what medication prescription over the counter a patient is taking, as that's going to affect uh, things like this. You know, basically what he's asking is, and you know, did you just hallucinate everything with this? Um, they're gonna they're gonna you know, as I said, ask you about recreational drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. And interestingly, I found an interesting factoid while researching this. If you, tell a, if you tell a doctor whatever, if he asks you about your recreational drug and alcohol use, uh, whatever you tell him, he doubles. I thought that was funny. Um, so if you tell him, you, you, I drink a few beers a day, and he's drank four, three, and he's a six pack. Um, uh, he's then going to ask you about your family history. Uh, some diseases have a well-known and proven genetic link. Uh, hemophilia has a proven genetic link. Uh, others are known to run in families, um, although the direct genetic link is less clear. Uh, things like diabetes, osteoporosis, depression, some type, types of cancer, uh, schizophrenia tends to run in families. Uh, if your mother or father had diabetes, for instance, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it, but it does mean you're at an increased risk. So he's going to ask you all of these questions about, uh, about these sort of things. After all this, so he sat there, he's made, a, made some lists. He's going to do what's called a system screen or review. Uh, 
it's really just a process to make sure the doctor hasn't missed anything. It's the whole thing. Um, they're going to include questions that seem maybe just slightly out of place in retrospect. How are you breathing? Uh, so where do you go to church? What do you think about God? Um, and perhaps some other informal questions is this. Uh, just to test their earlier conclusions uh, and earlier categories they may have drawn based on the other three questions. Um, from these, they're going to go and make a diagnosis and either recommend one of three things. They're going to recommend that you need to see a, psych a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist of some kind. They're going to say, you need to take some type of medication to control this. Or, and this is rare, I don't know. You, you, you almost never hear that. I used to say never, but I, I ran into a Christian doctor who actually had run, run into this, and he says, sometimes I say, I don't know. Um, so let's look, at some, let's look at some observations from some of these things, from the, from the medical community. Um, one of the things that really stands out about all of this is that scientists, medical doctors, they can only test the physiological. Uh, they can't put spirit in a box, you know. You can't, you, you can't run a litmus test for love. Um, scientists will readily admit that there, there's yet to be a practical way to study anything but the most physiological aspects of, of this phenomenon. Uh, and that's an interesting thing in and of itself, uh, in that it's been experienced by people groups, uh, the exact same phenomenon across cultures, across history, across people who have never, ever communicated, and in many cases isolated, one of the things I didn't talk about was New Guinea. People in Papua New Guinea, isolated tribes, talk about experiencing sleep paralysis. They, they say it's, it's spiritual in nature, but for up until 1970 or so, they didn't interact with anybody except the people in their own tribes and in their own jungle. They didn't know that there was an outside world. Um, so in that, you see, uh, you see this and you couple this with testimonies uh, of other people who emphatically describe seeing something hovering over another person who's having sleep paralysis. Uh, the idea of a source from uh, within man seems a little bit hard to grasp. Um, if you go and you look at, if you go to like PubMed, say, PubMed is a clearinghouse for peer-reviewed literature that's medical and psychological, uh, and sometimes there's other disciplines, but really that's kind of the big thing. If you go to PubMed and do a search on sleep paralysis or uh, the psychiatric incubus attack, uh, anything like that, what you're going to find is a whole lot of people making a whole lot of speculation with nothing really concrete. Um, if you do it, like I said, you'll find nothing concrete in the peer review area of things. Um, because they're going to look at it, at the very least, as psychosomatic. Uh, it has to do with neurons, i.e. Uh, and the medical community does, doesn't know that much beyond dissecting and naming things when it comes to neurons. Uh, I won't say it's a dirty little secret, but if you go and you if you go and you look at like success stories from people from neurologists and stuff, after a while you'll notice a common characteristic uh, list of success stories of people who went and been treated for neurological things is unfortunately very short. Um, in fact, the more that scientists learn about the human brain and the nervous system the more they realize it's unclear at this time what exactly is going on. For instance, here's a quote from a, from a graduate level textbook um, uh, uh, dealing, uh, the graduate le level medical textbook called Neuroscience. The reason for the high levels of brain activity during REM sleep, the significance of dreaming, and the basis of, restorative, of the restorative effect of sleep are topics that remain poorly understood. So, what they're kind of saying is, we have a hard time really quantifying the basics of what exactly is going on in sleep. Um, and that's actually one of the, coincidentally, that's one of the reasons neurology is such a hugely expanding field. Uh, you'll, if, if you go and do some research on neurology, neurology and radiology are exploding in the number of subspecialties available. As doctors gain technology, they are making huge strides in understanding and dissecting and realizing more and more about what we thought we knew. Uh, but what they find out is that we really don't have a clear understanding of what we thought we did. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, there's also problems with what I call the type of sleep or a purely neurological uh, medical diagnosis. Um, 
What you'll see a lot of times is people describing wake their their sleep. They wake and they go and they use, you know, they go they get up, they go and use the bathroom and they lay down again. And just as they're drifting off to sleep, they get hit with a full-on case of sleep paralysis where they can't move, they they see something, it causes intense fear. The textbook case that I articulated earlier. Um, so if if you have this if you have this chemical called acetylcholine that is that is turning your body off while while you dream, and so you wake up and you're still your mind is still in the dream state, but your body is still unable to move. Um, if you go up and if you get up and do something and then go back to bed and then are hit with sleep paralysis, it can't be acetylcholine stopping because you just it's a Um So. There's a real problem there that the medical community has a problem addressing. Um, and this is where, it, for me, it gets kind of weird. Uh, analytical psychology actually admits the reality of the spirit world, and I would tack onto that uh, one that is in conflict with a Christian worldview. Um, this is sort of a place, to, place for concern. Uh, let, me just, let me just talk to you real briefly about Jungian or analytical, analytical psychology. Carl Gustav Jung, the founder of analytical psychology, also known as, like I said, Jungian psychology, believed that out-of-body experiences, lucid dreams, astral projection, and other states of altered consciousness were in fact a real thing. He affirmed the spirit world. Uh, he describes an almost textbook case of a near-death experience in his book, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, and goes on to clearly intimate that he believes that there, there was a real spirit world out there. Uh, this, of course, aligns with testimonies, tests, and even, uh, you know, linking us back to uh, uh, Guy's talk earlier, even government programs where people who are experiencing things like lucid dreams, uh, sleep paralysis, and out-of-body experiences uh, were taught to exchange previously unknown past phrases and messages uh, in places where they couldn't interact, and then that those messages and passcodes were checked against each other to see if they matched, and they often did. Um, uh, incidentally, Carl, I, I was reading last night, Carl Gustav Jung, interestingly, for those of you who espouse a Christian worldview, uh, you'll, you'll sort of know what I'm talking about. He believed that he had two personalities inside him. One was a, uh, uh, of his, his age and his, his culture. Another one, he believed that he had another personality that sometimes took over and uh, uh, was, a, was a, uh, an old king from ages past, uh, an old Sumerian or Egyptian king that believed that it was a god, which I thought was interesting. He also, incidentally, he also at one point carved a little totem out of a piece of wood, put it in a shoebox, put it up in his uh, in his attic, and went and sometimes talked to it and prayed to it and wrote notes to it. Um, a little bit off the beaten path, but I thought that was interesting. Psychopathology. Uh, another problem is psychopathology does not use a correct definition of truth. And I'll tell you what I mean. William James, one of the architects of psychopathology, delineates a very telling idea that tends to permeate, what I find tends to permeate both the culture at large uh, and the field of psychology in particular. Uh, it's that truth is the expedient in the way of knowing. A statement is known to be true if it brings the right results. If it is, the, it is the expedient as confirmed by future experience. Uh, in other words, we can safely dispense with what is actually happening and go with whatever works. Um, that obviously is an idea of conflict with any sort of, any correspondence view of truth. Um, and this is the one that I actually, you guys will probably find the most interesting. Uh, there is a big confusion in the medical community over the use of drugs. Um, the whole idea of using drugs to treat sleep paralysis uh, is a little bit flimsy, not because it doesn't work. Sometimes it does. It's not perfectly accurate, but sometimes it does help people with sleep paralysis. Um, the problem is we just don't have a good understanding about how they work. And I'll give you, a, <laughs> I'll give you an example. Uh, I talked to I talked to several doctors to confirm this. Uh, if you know, if you want to know if someone is really bipolar. What you do is you feed them lithium, and you see if that helps. And that's, I mean, that's it. Uh, the medical community doesn't know why lithium works. 
they don't have, really have a clue. Uh, and you can know that by checking out, again, going to PubMed and checking out the amount of money and time and articles out there trying to figure out why lifting works. Um, it's, the, it's really the, it's fascinating. You know, if you do a, if you do a, uh, a search for sleep paralysis under peer-reviewed articles, you'll find that uh, you might wind up with 700 articles in the last 50 years. Uh, if you do a search for uh, why lithium and bipolar work together, uh, why lithium works to treat bipolar, you find like 20,000 articles. And nobody really knows why it works. They're still at the guessing phase after this. Um, and that's, that's particularly interesting because if I gave any of you, let's assume none of you were bipolar, if I gave any of you that same amount of lithium uh, that, I would, that you give to a person that is truly bipolar, uh, they die. I mean, it's, it's a lethal dose of, a lethal dose, lethal, excuse me, dose of lithium. Lithium toxicity, they don't talk about it a lot, but it's very, very, very serious. Um, so we've looked at sort of the medical community to look at this and uh, some possible pitfalls they might have in dealing with at least a spiritual case of sleep paralysis. Let's move on to our third point and talk about sleep paralysis and the Bible. Um, there's going to be sort of two subpoints of this. We're going to talk about, as I mentioned earlier, sleep paralysis in the book of Job, and then we'll go on to some common biblical causes of sleep paralysis. Um, we might have to go through this pretty quickly. It seems like I'm horribly behind schedule, as usual. That's like my life. Horribly behind um, schedule. Um, <clears throat> sleep paralysis in the book of Job. There's a couple things we need to remember about, about this. And I'll just give you a little bit of background for both the, both the Christians who maybe not have uh, read through Job lately and the, the materialist in the audience that, I, that I'm addressing. Um, there are three things you kind of have to keep in mind uh, as basics uh, when you look at the book of Job. One is, there are heavenly events that take place uh, that we know nothing about, yet these events affect our lives. Uh, and that's really sort of the, 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 the hermeneutic. That's the framework that Job takes place in. Um, we see Job's friends... Uh, Job's friends are trying to impugn his character and get him to give up his faith in God. Um, they urge Job's repentance for secret sins. They impugn God for putting him where he is. And they tell him he's rejected God. And then finally, uh, Job is chock full of supernatural speech uh, that many modern commentators tend to gloss over and treat as an artifact of merely a pre-scientific worldview, so we can take this or throw it out. Um, it's sort of sad. Really. Uh, it just seems Job is a perfect case, parenthetically, Job is a perfect case to see that to see where the supernatural has kind of been strip mined out of the Bible. So let me give you the first twelve verses of Job, and then we'll talk about the, the stuff in um, the stuff that's important. Job four, uh, chapter four, verses one through twelve. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, this is one of Job's friends, Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast, hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy word have upholden him that was fallen, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it has come upon thee, and thou faintest. It touches thee, and thou art troubled. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and thy uprightness of thy ways? Remember, I pray thee, who ever perished being innocent? Or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, that they plow, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. That's an interesting, interesting thing. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of, breath of his nostrils are they consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, the teeth of the young lion are broken. The old lion perishes for lack of prey, and the stout lion is well more scattered abroad. Now, now, here we get the interesting part. Describing an actual case, I believe, of sleep paralysis in the Bible that's sort of been swept under the rug a little bit by every commentator for the last 500 years. Um, now, a thing was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a little thereof. Um, it's important, to, interesting to note that several Bible commentaries that I've read on this passage 
uh, they don't like the implication of the next two verses, so they tend to sort of kind of assume that maybe God is, maybe Eliphaz is making a story, taking some, taking some liberties with it. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep fall upon men. So visions in the night, visions can be either in body or out of body, according to according to, you know, both the Old Testament and New Testament. It gets a little blurry sometimes. It's interesting, obviously, to, men, to see that it's happening when deep sleep fall upon men. Fear came upon me in trembling, which made all my bones to shake. So, what do we have? We've got fear and trembling. Uh, also notice that the fear, actually, as we see, uh, the fear becomes foreseen. It comes before you actually see anything. Then the spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying. So we notice here that um, the spirit is standing over him. He felt the presence. He sensed the presence. He sensed the fear before he actually saw the spirit. Uh, the spirit is now here, and it's going to whisper in his ear. He can't discern the form of him, uh, but there is some sort of an image before his eyes. So just to wrap that up, here's the next couple of verses. Uh, this is what the spirit tells us. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less men that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Doth not their excellency, which is in them, go away? They die even without wisdom. The Spirit goes on and tells them this stuff. And basically what happens is the Spirit, the spirit is telling him, Eliphaz, the reason Job is suffering is because he's done some bad. So just to sort of review here, what did he see? He saw a spirit, possibly after being awakened in the night. It happened when the deepest sleep comes on men, again like sleep paralysis. Uh, the spirit causes intense fear before he even sees it. Uh, so he must be able to sense it. Uh, Eliphaz is still there, even though there is incredible fear. Um, it passes before his face and tells him that Job is secretly at fault for his own misfortune. And this really, interestingly, this really sets the whole tone uh, for the rest of what Eliphaz has to say to Job, and by extension to Job's two other friends, Zophar and Bildad, who go after him and try to tell him he must have sinned and cursed God and God has punished him. Uh, the other, other interesting thing is that this isn't the only place in Job where sleep paralysis is, is mentioned. Uh, for the other mention, though, we're going to save that for just 30 seconds or so, and we're going we're gonna to move on to... <coughs> some common biblical causes of sleep paralysis. Um, <clears throat> First Peter 5a says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now one of the things, um, I, uh, if you don't already know, I have a ministry where I try and help people who experience sleep paralysis, try and terminate it. We've been the reason I'm here talking to you is because we've been successful 100% of the time uh, bringing, uh, if I feel it's a legitimate case of sleep paralysis, showing them that the, the name and the power and glory of Jesus Christ does in fact terminate it. Um, and one, so one of the things that I see constantly uh, is uh, the things that motivates these attacks, especially in cases where there is no obvious spiritual doorway left open uh, through negligent sin, uh, is that sometimes... Uh, God, the, the enemies of God are motivated with nothing but just pure hatred to the people that they attack. Um, there's a whole class here which, which is just pure rage on the part of the entities involved. They're so angry, so full of hate, they just can't help themselves is the basic thing. Um, people who fall into this category have committed no obvious sin oftentimes, but hold on to Jesus so tightly Sometimes they get attacked. You'll see this. Uh, I recently consulted on a case from uh, some people who were missionaries in a country that was close to the gospel. And they kept getting attacked, and we responded and uh, talked, talked about some emails and, and talked about some different things. 
they were like, they were full on. You couldn't hardly find some people based on, on what they said and what I discerned. You couldn't find people who were more full on about God, but they were still getting attacked. Um, they had committed, the point is, is they had committed no obvious sin, uh, but the enemy was, was walking around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And it ended up being sort of like a last ditch thing for them. Let's get to the other, other, other verse in Job. Um, for God does speak, now one way, now another, though it may not per, per, though man may not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings, turn man from wrongdoing and keep him from pride, to preserve his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. Uh, so here we see the young man uh, Elihu talking to Job. Many people tend to lump Elihu. Uh, as another of Job's false friends. But it's interesting to note, uh, and, and that may be the case, because some of the advice he gives is not perfect. Uh, but it's interesting to note that God does not find fault necessarily with Elihu's words, but he does find fault with Elihu, Zophar, and Bildad, and he tells Job to go offer sacrifices for those three guys, but does not include uh, Elihu here. Elihu is not included in this group. Um, what we see here is Elihu obviously mimicking the language we found in Job 4, spoken by Eliphaz, except that Elihu seems to be telling us that, at least in some cases, sleep paralysis and other nocturnal warnings are there to keep people from going down to the pit. Uh, this is exhibited again and again in stories of people with sleep paralysis uh, that I've consulted with. In these cases, oftentimes, someone will be intensely investigated in the truths of God. Is Christianity real? Is Judaism real? Am I a monotheist? Uh, questions like this. Um, and they're about to come to, or perhaps even already have come to, a conclusion about who God really is. Um, and they decide to sort of put that on hold a bit and think about it. Uh, sometime that night, they are oftentimes stricken with sleep paralysis, uh, complete with the sense presence of evil, someone trying to choke them or stand on their chest. So what I believe is going on in those cases, obviously, it, oftentimes, is they've come to a conclusion about what God is and who God really is, uh, but they refuse to act on it. So God is trying to show them, uh, to give them additional evidence, for lack of a better term to put this nicely, that a Christian supernatural worldview is in fact correct. Uh, some other information. Let's look at the first four of the Ten Commandments, uh, other sometimes called the Decalogue. Uh, now, we notice here where you're dealing with the first four commandments. They are all commandments dealing with affronts uh, before God, affronts to God, and not necessarily to other people. The grouping here in the Ten Commandments tends to support the overall spiritual aspect and the idea of God removing his hand for a moment to show us something uh, and to keep us from the pit, as Elihu mentioned earlier. I wouldn't say it's conclusive necessarily, uh, but is it interesting? I think it's pretty interesting. Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, um, in, in Reformed and Evangelical traditions. People tend to, people, different, different traditions break up the Ten Commandments differently. This is the more Reformed Evangelical uh, slash Anglican tradition. Uh, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, Sleep paralysis occurs often with those who have a background or who are active in the occult, new age, or animist religions. Uh, one example would be the Hmong people I mentioned earlier, Hmong people. Between 1961 and 1973, fully one-third of the Hmong population was displaced and relocated because of a bloody civil war that was going on. Uh, many of you who lived through you know, the Vietnam conflict may recall that. Uh, uh, one thread on the message board for Hmong people talked about sleep paralysis at length. Uh, and I was fascinated by this, so I did some digging. It turns out it's very common uh, in, that, in that culture. Many Hmong people came to the United States. Uh, they ended up converting to Christianity, uh, partly because they didn't want to do the intricate, intricate ancestor rituals involved in appeasing spirits of dead ancestors. Uh, and comments showed that various non-Christian members of the family began getting sleep paralysis uh, with a decreased ancestor, with a deceased ancestor coming at night and demanding the old rituals be done 
uh, or there would be trouble. Um, so the, pro the point is, is that they're putting other gods before Yahweh, and uh, you see a spiritual conflict there. Thou shalt make unto thee, uh, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Another thing that often triggers attacks of sleep paralysis are various kinds of talismans, uh, books, uh, books that are occult or supernatural or new age, uh, anything like that that could any, in any sense be deemed occult, uh, new age, or anything else. Uh, that might qualify as some type or have a likeness uh, that would be described as this graven image. Uh, tends to, tends to, this, this tends to happen. Um, I've seen several cases where people, they're otherwise good Christians, and sleep paralysis keeps happening to them. They cast the spirit out, and they can't figure out why. And it turns out, you know, they live in, like one guy, he lived in a two-story house, and he rented the upstairs to another gentleman, uh, who had brought a bunch of crystals and uh, was really into New Age and Buddhism, um, sort of the Western form of Buddhism, brought all that stuff into the house, and he immediately got, got hit with sleep paralysis. What was interesting is that their bedrooms were above each other, and that when the guy slept on the couch, he didn't get hit with sleep paralysis. And when he slept in his bed, right above where all of the, all of the New Age books and the crystals and stuff were, he would get hit with sleep paralysis. So there was some type of a proximity thing appearing to be going on. Uh, Exodus 5 and 6. Uh, Thou shalt not bow down, bow thyself down to them, nor serve them, for I the Lord of God, and a jealous God do me the iniquity of the fathers on the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that are that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Um, Those who, uh, those who have parents who do bad stuff, and, and I will say it, it, tends to be, it tends to be Masonic or, you know, uh, for lack of Satanism type parents who are into that stuff, high level free men, Masons openly practice witchcraft, Satanism, uh, uh, the incredibly spiritual aspects of yoga, uh, or anything really that would conflict with the singular message of salvation. Uh, oftentimes get hit with sleep paralysis repeatedly. Um, one lady that I, I helped with, she was emancipated from her parents who were avowed wicked and Satanists uh, when she was 16 years old and shortly thereafter became a Christian. Um, she'd been a Christian for 10 years but suffered from sleep paralysis almost nightly. Um, when, when, I, when I talked with her and we, we prayed together and when she had renounced the generational sins of her parents and even grandparents, uh, and ask Jesus to stand in the gap for her, uh, her nightly bouts of sleep paralysis stopped. Uh, thou, shalt make the name, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take his name in vain. Uh, those who consist, consistently blaspheme God uh, sometimes have limited occurrences of sleep paralysis, so oftentimes people tend to get sucked up into the New Age aspects of lucid dreaming and uh, out-of-body experiences. Um, how am I doing on time? It looks like I'm way over. Um, four minutes. Four minutes? Okay. I'm just going to go through it. Uh, if you guys need to leave, I totally understand. I'm just going to go through it. We've still got, yeah. I don't know, about ten minutes or more. Hopefully you're interested and not delay. Yeah, do finish. Uh, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Uh, and this is the one that I find the most interesting, but also tends to, I, I tend to scratch my head a little bit about it. Drastically overworking yourself or not getting enough sleep, oftentimes combined with drug use, work stress, family stress, these other things, uh, that's maybe even some type of sinful behavior, uh, bring, tends to bring on strong cases of sleep paralysis. Uh, there are a lot of stories of people who go out and have a crazy night, party on Friday night, don't go to bed, keep partying all day Saturday, 
and go to bed Saturday night or Sunday morning or whatever, uh, who are just struck with this terrible case of sleep paralysis. What's interesting is a lot of times those people have been brought up in a Christian church, so they have a familiarity with a supernatural worldview, but they just don't buy into it because they like to party. Uh, after, after the sleep paralysis experience, uh, they oftentimes go, you know what, Christianity is real, um, uh, supernaturalism is real, Jesus is real, I need to, I need to change. Um, what we see though, what's interesting, what I find particularly interesting, is that we saw God gave two to three verses uh, on all of the previous, all of the previous commandments. He gives one, two, three, four, uh, four verses for keeping the Sabbath holy, which is incidentally the one that we do the least amount. I'm not saying that we have to go out and you know follow the law or anything. It's just that we have a tendency. I'm just merely saying we have a tendency to radically overwork ourselves, especially in this culture. Uh, Revelation 9, 21 and 18, 23. Uh, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their, their thefts. And the light of the candle, Revelation 18, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in me, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in me. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by their sorceries were all nations deceived. One final category that seems to be an open doorway for spiritual experiences of sleep paralysis includes the use of hallucinogenic drugs. This is especially in, this, this especially in, conversation, in combination with doing anything against the other commandments often leads to sleep paralysis. In the above two examples, it bears noting that the word for sorceries is pharmakia, from which we get the word pharmacy. Uh, pharmakia is defined by Strong Street Dictionary as the use or the administering of drugs. Uh, that's the first definition. Two, poisoning. Three, sorcery, magical arts often found in connection with idolatry and oftentimes fostered by it. And then fourth, metaphorically, the deceptions and seductions of idolatry. Now, what's more, what's, what, I, what else I find interesting is the word drops most of its sorcery connotation as you trace back through, the, through to the root word pharmacon, which means a drug or a spell-giving potion. Uh, if you were here, uh, it, it, I, don't, I don't think anybody was here for the last day's conference, but uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Future, talked about that at length. Um, but it's interesting to see this, this, this real, real link between drug use and the spirit world. If you go back and read up uh, if you go back and read a historical book on uh, occultism and other cults of the ancient Near Eastern world, you find this commonly. You know, they would they would drink in excess, they would take drugs to hallucinate, and that is how they contact the spirit world. That's not, uh, you know, that's just historical. That, that's 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 just history. Um, so let's move on. Let's let's wrap this up here. Sleep paralysis. Why does it matter? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I believe, and I believe Joe and Guy do as well, um, that sleep paralysis is just another facet or aspect of a larger phenomenon that's going on uh, within our community at large. Um, between 15 and 40 percent of people worldwide have talked about experiencing sleep paralysis at least once in their lives. Between 15 and 40 percent, that means that this side of the room, statistically, has experienced sleep paralysis at least once. If you sit down to have dinner with five people, between one and two of them have had sleep paralysis. At least. Sometimes it's a lot more. I have reasons to actually think those statistics are a little bit higher. Um, why is that? People are being harassed and attacked. Um, as I said earlier, there aren't just a few people being harassed and attacked. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, as we've seen throughout the presentation, it happens across cultures that have little to no contact with each other. Um, it's been happening since antiquity began with Galen and the, uh, the Chinese book on medicine and, and dream interpretation. And it's continuing to happen now up until the present day. Uh, some studies put the number of people who experience sleep paralysis as high as 40%, as I said. Um, it's just not a phenomenon that's, not go that's going away. Um, 
We see oftentimes, in my opinion, people are being misdiagnosed. Uh, people go to their doctor, and the doctor sends them to uh, a psychotherapist who, who can't really help them. They give them drugs, might work, might not. But this is, a, this is positive. Uh, people aren't buying it. They go to their doctors, their doctor says, you need to go see a shrink. And the person says, no, I don't think so. This didn't happen in my head. Uh, again and again and again, I see both non-Christians non and Christians intuitively coming up with what I believe the correct interpretation is. That it's spiritual in nature. Uh, that these beings, the sense presence and the incredible sense of evil uh, in the middle, that, that they experience in the middle of sleep paralysis is all real. We also see, interesting that even non-Christians, um, if, if this was the 90-minute version of this talk, I'd have some videos to play of you of a Muslim guy who got stricken with sleep paralysis in the middle of the day and called out in the name of Jesus, and it stopped in mid-sentence. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you from a Christian worldview, Christian perspective, you see people are getting saved and coming to what I believe the truth is because of these experiences. Um, People go to bed. Um, people go to bed unreconciled with the Lord. They have a bout of sleep paralysis. They realize the reality of a supernatural worldview and its relevance even today. Uh, and they come to the conclusion that uh, Christianity really is real. Uh, I view that as an incredible positive. Uh, as I said, it's not going away. Uh, people are getting harassed and attacked as a worldwide phenomenon. And this is probably the saddest point here. The occult communities are extremely active in trying to explain the experience to other people. Um, the New Age belief of sleep paralysis is that there, this is your energy body waking up. Um, and then you are, you are experiencing spiritual evolution. And you're, you're moving on to your next stage as an evolutionary in our collective evolutionary journeys. Um, the New Age belief, uh, it's, it's full of variations, but that's the basics. Uh, the spiritist belief uh, can really range, it's really, it's, it's range bound, but it really ranges from whatever, it really comes down to whatever particular spiritual belief the system is focused on, i.e., if it's an ancestor worship based uh, spiritist belief, they say it's, it's, it's great grandpa. If it's uh, ghosts, you know, ghosts and, and demons, they say it's ghosts and demons. Uh, the other types of spiritist ex explanations, um, it's interesting that some of them call it pretty closely to home. They say that it is evil spirits uh, and they're angry at you and they want to destroy you. Um, but their answer is actually incorrect, I believe. The answer is, you just need to do more rituals. You need to sacrifice a bigger cow. Um, uh, the, the, the most germane to probably this, this festival and this talk and this discussion in Western culture in general is the lucid dreaming and out-of-body experience and astral travel communities. They all see this as a stepping stone into an active lucid dream or out-of-body experience. Uh, and you will go on, go on the internet, go on the web, and the web is rife with people explaining this uh, in those in those circumstances. Like, oh, you've had sleep paralysis? Well, that just means you're a natural at out-of-body experiences. Instead of fighting this thing that, I mean, I realize that it attacked you and assaulted you. Instead of fighting it, it's, it's, it's good. And you just need to follow it. Um, uh, the future. The future of sleep paralysis is, is mixed. Um, so few people knew about it. But up until recently, um, the phenomenon, uh, as it stands, didn't have anybody ex anybody trying to explain it to people, anybody talking about it. Um, it was just something that happened in the uh, New Age and Occult communities were having a field day. 50% um, of the emails I get regarding this experience are from people who want to share their experience about how it really showed them the reality of the spirit world and the reality of good and evil. Like there really is a real good and there really is a real evil. 
they are moral absolutes, and in many cases open their eyes to the gospel. Um, that's positive. Um, perhaps the most troubling thing, of course, is uh, the fact that the web is so rife with alternative explanations that even the people who are sort of proponents, proponents of it don't see that it's really helping them. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you box them in logically, they'll, they'll, they'll admit to that. Um, finally, if you guys are having experiences or you know somebody who is and uh, you want to talk to them, you want to try and help them, uh, I'm available. This is my website, stopsleepparalysis.org. That's how you get me. Um, I just have, I have one final question here I'd like to ask. Um, we saw about, I don't know, 15 hands, maybe 15% of the people, uh, when we asked how many people have experienced sleep paralysis. How many people have experienced sleep paralysis now that I've given the talk and we know a little bit more about what it is? Show of hands? Yeah. Yeah, about 20% more. <clears throat> so anyway, this concludes the talk. Uh, thank you so much for being a great audience. I uh, appreciate it.